Hey, and welcome to my Tech Extra and Digital Extra session on creating accessible social media content. My name is Bex, or Rebecca Broad, if you're on LinkedIn. And the first thing I want to make clear before I get into anything is that I completely welcome your questions. You can send them in via the chat box um, on social media platforms by tagging me at Rebecca Comms on Twitter or Instagram, and we can also chat at the end of this talk. Any question would make me happy. Honestly, you could ask me a very technical social media management question. You could ask me my favorite character in Ted Lasso or what my tattoos are. Like any question would make me very happy. Um, that doesn't necessarily go for all of the speakers, but my boundaries regarding my questions are pretty open. Um, I also want to say, please feel free to make any further requests for this material to be made more accessible. I have tried my best to keep my slides and what I want to say as clear as I can. Um, but I almost certainly will slip up and I completely accept that. So if you'd like things in different colours, in different formats, let me and the team know and we'll do our best to get that to you. So I will give a quick intro to myself and then we'll dive into the session. I was born in Blackpool, which is where my dad and I are in this first photo in which I'm wearing a very fetching red outfit with socks and sandals, absolutely classic. Um, I was mostly brought up in Leicester, as signified by my dad's rather vibrant Leicester Tigers fleece here. Um, and in 2013, I moved to Devon for university, where I studied biological sciences at the University of Exeter, which I appreciate has nothing to do with social media management, but we'll skip by that. Um, hopefully that gives you some reasoning behind my accent, which often confuses people and confuses me too sometimes. Um, a northernism or a proper Midlands vowel will absolutely appear at some point in this talk. Um, but these days I live in Exeter with my partner Jo, who is also self-employed and annoyingly is the best writer I know, including myself. Um, it was never my plan to start a business. Um, a lot of people say, what made you start a business? And that wasn't the thing for me. It was one of those accidental entrepreneur stories. Um, but six years ago, I was studying at the University of Exeter and I was a, a studying part-time disabled student. Um, and I found that as well as working part-time catering jobs and all that kind of thing, I could use my writing skills to help support myself financially. Um, I very quickly expanded from copywriting into social media management, marketing strategy, um, events management, sponsorship relations, um, mostly learning through experience, but also occasionally via internships with local agencies in Exeter and um, qualifications. So here are the logos of some companies I've worked with in the past. Um, my very first client was Rock Solid Race, who you may remember if you're into running and mud and obstacles at any point. Um, and right now I'm mainly working with Vixen Labs, who are Europe's leading voice agency, Southwest Mutual, who are trying to set up um, a high street bank for our region, mutually owned, and Exeter City Futures, who I'm sure you'll have heard of if you're, if you're based in Devon. Um, a fair amount of my interest in accessibility stems from my own experiences. So as a neurodiverse, bisexual, young woman, um, the tech and digital world isn't always the most accessible or welcoming to me or necessarily designed to encourage my input. Um, so I do want to say a particular thank you to Chris and the Tech Exeter and Digital Exeter team for creating this event in the way that they have. Um, and for encouraging me and making it possible for me to share my knowledge with you all, hopefully. Um, so yeah, that's enough of the preamble. Let's dive in. So for the context of this talk, accessible content is that which is understood by the widest possible audience. Um, and I want to make it clear that no one piece of content that you ever create will ever be accessible to everyone. Everyone has their own needs, their own preferences, um, the way that they process information in the world. But the key really is to do your best to convey your meaning. And that goes for whether you're talking about um, 
something on a personal social media platform or a business or a charity or, or any messages you're really putting out into the digital world. For me, the Venn diagram of best practice social media management and accessible social media content is a circle, which is to say if you're trying to create effective, engaging and interesting content about your business, which I really hope you are if you're on social media, um, accessibility features need to be part of that. They're not just something that you, you kind of consider right at the end. Um, for me personally, accessibility features need to be considered as a core part of any piece of content that you're putting out. Um, just like, for example, your, your hashtags might be, or, or what your brand colours are and how they show up, whether your organisation's tone of voice is showing through. These are all things that we consider when we make social media posts um, as people who work in this industry. And for me, I want to see accessibility considerations be as important as those things. The reason accessibility um, technically is best practice is partly because, as the government website says, one in five people have a long-term impairment, illness or disability, and even more people than that have a temporary disability. And to quote Gov UK, health conditions can impact a person's ability to understand a message, either because of cognitive impairment or because they are unable to see, hear or otherwise access the information. I think it's very simple for us to just take one part of that into consideration, like oh, what people can't see my content, what people can't hear my content, and, and it's about bringing all of those considerations together to make something truly as accessible as it can be. Um, to put it bluntly as well, your business can't afford to alienate a fifth of the population. Um, we're not talking about ideal clients here. So we're not talking about, oh, we don't, we don't care about a fifth of people because they're not our ideal client. What we're saying is that people of all ages and interests and different demographics, um, they all will have different access needs. Um, even if you are happy alienating one in five people, which you really shouldn't be because Equality Acts 2010 and all of that, um, just stay with me here. If you decide you don't have the time or, or the interest or the skills to make your social media content accessible, you might actually be putting off the remainder of your audience. Um, so for example, if I am scrolling LinkedIn and I see a video, I will scroll right on by if I don't see any captions. Um, I won't watch it. I just, I just won't. Um, and actually, I'm not weird in that way. There are many studies such as um, this one which was led by Verizon in 2019 which find that videos with captions are more likely to be watched for longer and that captions are important to people even if they have no problem listening to videos like myself. I prefer just watching captions and, and reading content rather than listening to it and watching it. I just find that I process the information more easily. I also don't necessarily want a bunch of audio just like jumping out from my screen at me at any one time. There's all sorts of reasons that captions um, can really help. And so unsurprisingly, caption your videos is my first actionable tip of six that I'm gonna be giving you today on how to make your social media content more accessible. So it might be a little difficult to see, but this image is a screenshot of a video clip with captions. It's an interview I did in my role as social media manager for Southwest Mutual. And here I'm interviewing Julie Hawker of Cosmic about, funnily enough, digital and financial inclusion. And these things are all related, but I won't go there. Um, one of the first things people love to say to me about captions these days, especially when they find out about my work with Vixen Labs, who operate in the voice technology industry, is how easy captioning is these days. It's like, oh, it's brilliant. You know, you can just press the little captions button on Instagram. You can get software like Otter to transcribe it, um, even in real time now. And to that, I always say, those technologies are good, and I welcome the progress, but they are really also not great. Um, the captions they generate 
trust me, are riddled with errors and, and misspelling and confusing punctuation. And so what I really want to say is when you do caption your videos, make sure you do it correctly and clearly. Um, I always think like uploading an error riddled transcription file is, it is better than nothing in the way that a cup of green tea is better than nothing because it has a bit of caffeine in it. But um, it's not a mug of coffee. <laughs> it's, that is not my strongest metaphor, but we're rolling with it. So when I say caption your videos, I mean do it properly, do it correctly and clearly. The way I personally do this is by filming a video. I then run it through software called Descript. I then go into that file and I edit the text to take out all of the errors. I then export that file. And at that point, I've seen the text enough and I've heard the audio enough that I need to hand it over to a video editor. And they make sure that everything is correctly synchronized and presented um, before I upload it for a client. Um, yeah, I could do all that myself. That's a, a process that you can do. But at that point, I need someone else's eyes on it. Video captions aren't just needed on your nice long interviews, like the example that I had with Julie at Cosmic. Um, personally, I think they are needed across your audiovisual content. And so that means your LinkedIn stories, for example. That means your Instagram reels and, and other audiovisual content on that platform. There's a lot on Instagram for sure. IGTV um, stories. Um, Captions are also needed on things like audiograms that you post on Twitter and, and across social media platforms. So regardless of, of how you're presenting audiovisual content, I want you to think about captions. And it doesn't matter if those words like stories or, or reels or audiograms don't necessarily mean anything to you. Um, it's okay if they don't. It depends on um, which platforms you're on and how you're using them. But the, the kind of key point is that if you have audiovisual social content, which I encourage you to at least try out because it's great, please make sure that the information contained within that is accessible in a written format. Um, and that can be separate to that post as well, as long as you, as long as you point to it. So um, for example, on stories on Instagram, I, I will record a story with the little circle thing. When I see that that gets up to a full-time story, I listen back to my recording. I then type out the exact text that I say to accompany it to go on that slide. It doesn't matter if I trip over my words. It doesn't matter if I, I say something wrong. I can always put in square brackets to correct myself. Um, but I'll make sure that that is visible on that Instagram story slide. I'll also make sure that the font that I use is clear to read. So I don't use that one, which is like big capitals really spaced out. I find that hard to read. And I also make sure that the colours contrast clearly enough to, to make the text readable. So for me, um, with brand colouring mainly revolving around green, I'll make sure that I use either a really light green on a really dark green background of the text or the flip way round, whatever works best for the composition of that image. Which is, if I say so myself, the most wonderful segue into my second actionable tip. Um, which again relates to design composition. Please make your logos, your images, your, your infographics, your text, anything visual, please make it highly visible. Otherwise, it misses the point. Um, some questions to ask yourself are, is the font easy to read? Um, script and highly serifed fonts can be a lot more difficult to read. Is the text color dissimilar enough to the background? So with a lot of these pinks and purples, being, being close to the color of the background makes it, it really more difficult to read. Um, are elements of the image big enough? Like, is the text big enough? Uh, is the logo big enough? Um, I actually hadn't managed to see this logo until I'd seen it on this big screen, um, which isn't great, especially if you consider that these are all Instagram examples, and people mainly look at Instagram on their phones, which are very little. Um, all of these screenshots could very quickly and easily have been made a lot clearer. Um, and I really hope, <laughs> these are just randomly screenshotted from my explore tabs. Please don't track these people down and tell them that I use them as an example. Um, but I'm always happy to look at content like this if you have any questions. 
Um, but honestly, my eyes see visuals like this and my brain just goes, nope, like, no thanks. Um, I'm not gonna waste energy looking at them and deciphering the info. And at that point, they've lost me. And, and that's, that's a real shame as well, especially for things like events, um, for, for content that you wanna share with your audience. You really just, you don't wanna give them any example, any, you don't wanna give them any opportunity to move on. Um, you want them to really understand your message. There are some really cool online tools that you can use um, to check and assess your images and your selection of colours, um, such as WebAIM's Contrast Checker. Um, but you can also just ask your audience. I think often we forget this as, as business leaders and as social media professionals. You can actually just check in with the people that follow you in different ways. Um, and actually just ask them, like, are, are these visuals accessible? Am I presenting the information in the way that is useful to you? Um, is there any way that I can improve this, you know? Um, how can I make it easier for you to understand my core messages? Um, so yeah, definitely think about making your visuals actually visible. That being said, not everyone can access any type of visuals information. So my third actionable tip is to provide alt text, so alternative text. Um, alt text is a short description of a visual and if you've been involved in um, like website and uploading images to websites and things like that for your company, you'll probably have seen this appear there first instead of social media platforms. Um, but the origins are kind of similar. So alt text is a short description of a visual, whether it's a photo or a graphic or an infographic. And alt text allows people who use screen readers to access social media, to understand your image, even if they can't see it. Um, so for example, for this image, um, for alt text, I might write a sunset over X bridges, this is actually last night, um, with yellow and pink clouds in the foreground. Joe takes a photo with his phone, um, with his back to the camera, something like that. Um, and you can see that that would come under this field here before I upload the tweet. So this is when I'm, when I'm creating this tweet. And different social media platforms allow users to provide alt text in different ways. Um, I won't go through all of them here, partly because some of them will probably have changed by the time this comes out. But what you're looking for is anything which is a text field. So things like add description here in Twitter, or alt text on Instagram, or just the button alt on Facebook. I think it's alt as well on LinkedIn. Um, but I will just quickly go through some good practice. So firstly, make sure your descriptions are concise. Um, Twitter actually gives you a thousand characters, um, which is a lot more than they give you in an actual tweet. Um, but you don't need to use all of that up um, unless your image is incredibly complex and you've got a lot to describe. In which case, I'd probably advise that you simplify it. So it's kind of a balance here of what you need to say and, and what the image is showing. Um, that being said, definitely use the space that you need to help people to understand what's going on in the image. Some platforms like Instagram, this is a screenshot of, of one of my posts. Um, if you're writing alt text in platform on your phone, so you've opened up Instagram using the app on your phone, you can add alt text after you've posted the photo or the image. Um, via editing. So this is, this is already live. I can go in and edit this alt text, which is also a good point thinking back. If you go on your Instagram and you've got loads of images that have no alt text, there's nothing stopping you from going back into those images and adding some alt text. Um, other social media platforms like Twitter, um, you need to write the description before you post because as social media managers know, tweets are not editable. And if that has changed by the time this comes out, I don't know what I'll do. I don't know what anyone will do. Other platforms like LinkedIn do make it harder to add alt text depending on where you're posting. So there's, there's often discrepancies between using the LinkedIn platform on your phone versus your desktop. Um, and also in scheduling software like Buffer or Hootsuite, um, which is what many social media managers use to keep up with different accounts across platforms. So do be aware that 
unless you're posting in platform, it can be harder to add alt text. Um, so for example, with this LinkedIn post that I've got up for Southwest Mutual, I can go in and edit this to add an alt text later, but the character limit, which I think is 140 for alt text for LinkedIn is, is quite limited. And so in this case, and, and quite often in other cases as well, such as on Instagram where photos and images can be quite complex, I would add image descriptions. So these are like an extended version of the alt text and they're, as the, as the phrase says, like a lot more descriptive than alt text. Um, they are also a chance for people to help, to help your audience understand the image, even if they aren't using screen readers. So alt text isn't really accessible. You can't see alt text unless you're using a screen reader, but image descriptions are in the actual body of the post. Um, so, so anyone can see this. And if, for example, they're not quite sure what I'm showing here with the, with the graphic, they can look up at the caption of the post. Um, another good thing about image descriptions is that they're also a chance to build on the message of the post, if necessary, so you can expand on what you've been saying, you can add in key words, for example. Um, they're, they're, just, they're just great, you should add them. Um, a response I sometimes hear of from social media managers or digital comms managers or any of these roles that we have is that they don't have time to write alt text. And I understand that time pressure. I want to say that now, um, especially if you're posting in a pressured environment. Um, so for me, for example, if I'm live tweeting an event, I might be very quickly taking screenshots of slides. I might be uploading GIFs, for example, to, to quickly respond. Um, and so I understand that it's, it's not necessarily easy to just to go in and quickly write um, a piece of alt text or, or description. Um, to that I always say, uh, practice makes perfect. You don't have to take a very long time writing these things. Um, but also be aware that more and more these days platforms are using their own AI to add alt, alt text to your images, even if you're not. And so often um, you'll have spent ages creating this beautiful image for Instagram with your brand colors and, and your logo and some amazing message that you really want to share. And Instagram will be like text on black or something like that, like really not cool. Um, and sometimes, sometimes they, 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 as in the social media platforms, will alert you to the fact that they've created this description for you. And sometimes they don't. Um, again, depends on where you're using them. So even if it's just a sentence or two, it's worth making sure that you're the one dictating that conversation and you're the one providing your audience with the experience you want them to have of your post. Otherwise, you're quite likely to end up with a very basic and unhelpful machine-generated description of an image. And these will improve and they will get better and I'm in no way against machine learning, just to be clear. But you can, you can help it, help it along. My fourth recommended action, which is linked to screen readers and how blind and, and people with low vision access your content, is to make sure your posts make sense when you read them out. And this might sound overly obvious, but in reality it has a number of, of quite practical impacts that you have to think about right from when you're um, like drafting customer journeys in a content calendar, for example. And the first of these is to please avoid writing long, overcomplicated sentences. Um, most, most of us know this um, kind of intuitively anyway through experience that short, snappy sentences um, help people understand your content and, and therefore to engage with it, um, regardless of their reading comprehension or, or attention span or platform or whatever the content is. Um, using shorter sentences um, helps you to really cut through. And there is a lot of noise out there on social media platforms. Um, part of making your post make sense is, is not about unnecessarily abbreviating your words. And actually, I only learned this in practice this week. Um, so I use a, a Chrome extension called Speechify, um, which reads content out to me. It's worth, it's worth a go. Um, and it read a tweet out to me with the word please abbreviated to PLS. Um, so it just said, 
they had the kind of overall um, uh, message of the tweet and it said PLS, which hugely confused the message of the tweet. And it also confused me because suddenly I wasn't listening to the rest of the tweet or considering what the call to action was. I was just sitting there like, PLS, like what does, what does that mean? Um, so yeah, completely interrupted the flow of the post. Um, so yeah, avoid abbreviations where, where possible. Um, a big no-no is fancy fonts. I know you think they probably look cool. Um, you might know these as Instagram fonts or, or special lettering. Um, but to simplify it, any character that you can't produce on your keyboard, on your laptop, like, like an actual laptop keyboard, should be off limits when you're creating social media posts. Um, fancy fonts um, like these and these little symbols here um, are actually, yeah, they're, they're symbols and, and mathematical letters. And these actually make no sense to screen readers. So here are some examples from Twitter, which are inaccessible. Um, you will see these letters like across social media posts. Um, they're getting particularly popular on LinkedIn at the moment. Um, please don't use them. I also think they look really cringeworthy. Like, <laughs> just say what you want to say. Um, but basically, things like this mean that, for example, um, the Isle of Man Tourist Board have taken Winter Holiday to the Isle of Man and they've they've put it into a fancy font generator and then put it back into their social media post. Um, just, just don't do it. If you use these fonts, um, chances are that you're losing your audience, um, you're annoying some of them, you're making it inaccessible to some of them, and you're also probably gonna get someone like me who is an accessibility fan, who will reply in the comments or, or tag a bot. There are some great bots on Twitter right now. Um, who then, who then um, create like a video of what exactly your posts sound like when read out by a screen reader, and it will not sound good. And then you'll be embarrassed as well. So just, just don't do it. The fourth part of making your posts make sense is to use camel hashtags or camel back hashtags, and there's always some argument about which one of those, but by that I mean capitalise the letter at the start of each word in a hashtag. Um, and the name comes from capital letters looking like pumps on a camel's back. Um, not only do I think this looks neater and actually easier to read for, for anybody consuming this content, it also means that screen readers will actually read out the words as separate words instead of one long word. So, um, for example, here, Plastic Free July is three words in one hashtag, but I've capitalised the letters at the start of each. Um, the infamous example of this is obviously Pen Island. You want it to be Pen Island. Um, also, please don't use loads of hashtags. Like, hashtag strategy is a, is a whole other topic for a whole other talk. But for now, um, keep it to three a post if possible. Um, also, unfortunately, as shown by this screenshot from LinkedIn, which I took today to make sure it still wasn't working, social media platforms themselves have yet to catch up to this accessibility best practice. They will still recommend and, and provide shortcuts for non-capitalized words in hashtags, which is annoying. Um, you've just got to work around it and to write what you know is right. My fifth recommended action for accessible content is to repurpose. And this is probably the tip that I'm worst at. So this is a note to me as much as to anybody else. Some platforms just aren't accessible to people. They, that's just a fact, they just aren't. Um, and also your audience is scattered across platforms. Um, People, not everyone who is on Facebook is also on LinkedIn. Not everyone who is on Twitter is also on Pinterest, for example. Um, and so if, you're, if your business, if your organization, if whatever you're saying is an important message, you want people to hear it. And that means saying it in multiple places. What this really doesn't mean <laughs> is copying and pasting the same text, the exact same text from Twitter to Facebook, to Instagram, to LinkedIn. That is one of my absolute top bugbears, please don't do this. If you find yourself doing this, um, you probably need to have a think about 
what you're using your platforms for, why you're on different platforms, if you've got the time to make sure that your content is, is being made for that platform itself, and also think about your audience journeys. Again, a whole other talk, but what repurposing really means is to rephrase and recommunicate the same message, the same call to action, um, the, the same core of that piece of content in different places. And sometimes that means taking off social media completely um, and putting it onto your website, for example, into your email newsletter, into a magazine article. Um, it's one of the, the tips of best practice social media management that you shouldn't build your business on social media because there is nothing stopping anybody from shutting those platforms one day and then your audience being just kind of gone. So please, please make sure you build other ways of communicating with your audience. So my sixth and final actionable tip, which is potentially a slight cop out, but important all the same, is to keep learning. So there will always be more to learn about accessibility. I am almost certain I've already made mistakes this week in making my posts accessible. And that's not because I'm not trying, but because I'm human. Um, and we've also got to keep learning because accessibility is it's a hot topic right now um, and, and getting more and more so for reasons even outside inclusivity. Um, and so a whole part that I haven't gone into is, is how important accessibility is for, for factors like SEO um, and algorithms and discoverability, partly because I want you to do these things regardless of those factors, um, but partly because it's a whole different ball game. Um, but basically accessibility is important for why certain users see certain posts. Um, platforms are looking at this, this stuff more carefully, I think now more than ever, as much as I hate that phrase. And they are, they are creating solutions and rolling them out as we speak. Um, like I said before, there's half a chance something big will have happened in between me recording this talk and you watching it. Um, for example, last night, Instagram announced that it's probably going to be killing the swipe up feature, which is, is big news for social media managers. But things like this just come out of the blue. Um, and the only way to really keep up and to, and to kind of keep at the forefront of accessibility is just to, just to keep doing it and keep learning, keep listening to what leaders in the field are saying across different social media platforms. Each platform is so um, different and has different ways of working, that no one can be an expert on any on all the social media platforms. You'll have noticed, for example, that I haven't gone as at all into Pinterest here. I haven't really gone into Facebook quite so much. Everyone will have their own specialities, so make sure that you're listening to a wide range of audiences about this stuff. So those are my six actionable tips to make your social media content more accessible. So we've got one, Caption your videos, please, wherever they are. To ensure your visuals are visible. Provide alt text and image descriptions where possible and necessary. Make your posts make sense, and that means writing clearly, not using abbreviations or fancy fonts. Um, and to use camel case hashtags. Five is to repurpose your posts onto other platforms and outside of social media. And six is to keep learning and keep adapting what you're doing. And you should do these things for multiple reasons. Hopefully you've, you're kind of on board with this by now, but you wanting to do these things to reach the most people, to increase your business success via social media, to benefit all of your audiences, regardless of any access challenges they, they do or don't have. And also because it's, it's just the right thing to do, which I imagine you kind of believe as you're listening to this. Um, there are many further accessibility tips that I've not gone into here, um, either because they are slightly contested or because it would take too long, but please know that this is definitely not all of it. Um, there are other things about emoji use and overuse, um, things like flashing images, using diverse photography. Um, this is a whole world that I really encourage you to go out um, and do further research into. And what I'll do is to, to um, add some kind of extra sources that you guys can go um, read and watch and all things like that. But if you take one thing away from this talk, I'd like it to be for you to keep an open mind, whether 
you're a business leader who doesn't touch social media or whether this is your full-time job. Um, try not to get too defensive when you hear these things as well. Um, it can be very difficult for people to hear. I know I've experienced it myself. Um, people who do social media content for a living, it's, it's very difficult when someone says, hey, what you're doing is excluding people. That's not what we want. You know, we, we're, we're working in a social realm for a reason. Um, but that discomfort is kind of key. It's, it's signaling that something needs to change in your practice, in your processes, in your, in your standard operating procedures, however, however you frame these things. Um, and if you don't feel that discomfort, it means you don't care, and that's worse. So personally, I think it's, it's worth caring about people's experiences, um, even, if that is, even if that experience is as simple as a tweet about your business. I will end there and say thank you for listening, and I welcome any questions.